In the year 2148, explorers on Mars discovered the remains of an ancient spacefaring civilization. In the decades that followed, these mysterious artifacts reveal startling new technologies, enabling travel to the furthest stars. The basis for this incredible technology was a force that controlled the very fabric of space and time. They called it the greatest discovery in human history. The civilizations of the galaxy call it... Hey there guys, Gutslove here, and welcome to a special event on this channel, M7 Month, or for the rest of us, Mass Effect Month. I adore the Mass Effect games. They're one of my favorite trilogies in gaming. I've decided to revisit the original games and just figure out how this game became popular, expand it in its lore, how I got wind of the games, and what made me stay hyped up for the next chapter. Now, I'm warning you right now, I began the trilogy with the second game. This was before the trilogy pack announcement, so I may be a bit biased in this quasi-retrospective. Sit back, prop up a bottle of wrinkle, and join me as we take a look back at this space opera. It's been many years that humanity joined the intergalactic community, a community full of many alien life forms, from the all-female Asari, the military-trained Taurians, the intellectual Salarians, and many other species. Humanity was no longer alone in the galaxy. Our journey begins with Commander Jane or John Shepard, voiced by Jennifer Hale and Mark Mir, aboard the maiden voyage of the Alliance and Torian warship, the SSV Normandy. As the crew head to their shakedown mission on Eden Prime, the utopia-like human colony, Shepard is informed by their captain, Anderson, voiced by Keith David, and a Torian specter named Nihilus that they are not just on this ride for fun. A Prothean beacon was found on Eden Prime, and it is their mission to take the beacon back to the Citadel Council. Prothean technology is highly valuable, due to all of their tech being based off the extinct species. So giving this beacon to the Council as a gift of trust could provide humanity a better position in the galactic society. But their briefing is cut short, as they receive a transmission from Eden Prime. Everything cuts out after that, no comm traffic at all. It just goes dead. The colony is under attack by an unknown threat. And it is the crew's job to retrieve the beacon before it is damaged, or worse, stolen. Nihilus is surprised by a fellow Turian specter, Saren, and in a moment of security, treason is afoot. Shepard reaches the beacon and obtains a frightening vision, synthetics butchering organics. What was this vision supposed to mean? This is nothing. Saren, aboard the dreadnought that attacked Eden Prime, is angered. A human had used the beacon before it was destroyed. As Shepard's crew informs the Council of what happened, their accusation towards Saren's betrayal is dismissed due to having no evidence. Gathering said evidence is not an easy task. Asking for some help never harmed anyone. A Turian, Garrus, and a Krogan, Rex, join Shepard's cause, helping in the search until they find the Corian, Tally, with the very thing they need to put Saren on the run, and off the Spectre ranks. It is then that Shepard is honored the title of the first human specter, given resources and information that will aid in the search of Saren, what he's looking for, and take him down. But this is only the story of the first game in a nutshell. There's so much more involved in the story, for nothing is as it seems. For story to gameplay, the player has the choice of playing six different classes. From the typical but expert in armed soldier to the more biotic and tech heavy sentinel and everything in between you can choose between the combat tech and biotic classes soldier and sentinel are just a few there are others that also specialize in two areas like half combat half biotic or even half tech and so on they all have their perks and cons it is up to the player to choose what to give up 
The weapons you get in the game vary from your pistols, submachine guns, rifles, shotguns. They can be buffed with different types of upgrades, like toxic bullets, to enhancing accuracy. Depending on the class, Shepard will specialize a certain range of guns. Soldiers get all of the guns. While classes like the Engineer are only specialized in certain weapons, sacrificing certain combat perks for tech, like hacking and such. A balance for any player. I myself am a fan of the soldier class. I like my guns. Let's quickly talk about the combat. It is a bit wonky, especially the whole cover system. It's not fully functional compared to the other games that follow it. You won't be using cover as much as running behind crates or walls then go all Leroy Jenkins on an enemy before hiding again. Also, you better point in the right direction when executing your abilities, especially if you have your quick reaction buttons, or else you'll be wasting your recharge time. Lastly, INFINITE BULLETS. Just don't let your guns overheat. <laughs> like it was mentioned before, you recruit three different characters. I'll only gloss over a bit of their backstory since it's a bit too much for one video. I highly recommend you play these games or at least look up their backgrounds if you're interested. Garrus, Turian Species, Infiltrator Class, Never Touches Rifles. He got into CSEC to follow in his father's footsteps, but is quite agitated about how CSEC handles justice. He joins your cause to bring legit justice to the galaxy, kinda like Batman. Rex, Krogan species. Vanguard class, shotguns are his best friend. Big badass who left his homeworld, became a mercenary, and likes to headbutt. He's peeved about what the Citadel Council has done to his species. He still has hope for a better future for his kin. Tally, Corian Species, Engineer Class, she likes playing with tech. Adorable Cinnamon Roll, who is out on her rite of passage, wishes to become the best tech specialist to help out her species reclaim her homeworld from the dreaded Geth. You also recruit Ashley Williams in your shakeup mission. Human Species, Soldier Class, doesn't trust aliens. Kind of xenophobic military born who has her life screwed for what her grandfather did in the first contact war between the humans and the Turians. Full of attitude and will not take shit from anyone, not even the commander unless reasoned with. Later on, you get Bioware's favorite character, and I'm not exaggerating, Liara Tissoni. She's... Uh, a bit of a nerd. Asari species, Biotic class, she's awkward. She's a Prothean Weibo, breathes with her freaking throat every time she talks. Doesn't particularly like her mummy, but still loves her. Likes to look into your brain, and has no social skills. It's quite baffling how much the writers worked hard to make these characters likable, and they are in their own way. They did achieve this. Having each one of the races that join our team being ambassadors for us, telling us about their personal lives and cultures, and yet they just had to shove Liara down our throats. But we're getting too ahead of ourselves. Wait, I'm forgetting someone, aren't I? Oh yeah, Kaden Alenko. He's boring. I said it. Biotic soldier, human species, suffers migraines due to implants. At least he is intelligent enough to object about humanity having a seat on the council too soon. Even when exploring the romance, just talking to him... <laughs> oh, um, uh, spoilers, if you romance him in this game and romance someone else in the second, he'll try to win you over in the third one and persuade you in leaving your Mass Effect 2 hubby. Wow, still boring. Depending on the mission, it's best to keep a certain specialist with a specific ability to pursue side missions, which are too much in this damn game. From mining for resources, searching protean artifacts, disrupting part of the Geth's plans, and protecting the galaxy from mercenaries, space pirates, and the pro-human group Cerberus. A few of these side missions help out in forming a stronger alliance with your alien companions, from getting an ancient family armor, giving them information that can help out their species, and helping them hunt down this organ-growing and harvesting bastard. Yeah, organ trafficking in Mass Effect. And it's only in this game, I mean, yes, you get info on Krogan testicles on the black market every now and then, and in the rest of the trilogy, <laughs> because of a certain thing that the Council did. Which I won't spoil, but then again, everyone watched what happened in the third game. I'll still keep that bit under wraps. Now, onto the things I don't like about this game. Number one, the cover system. 
or better yet, how flawed it is in this game compared to Mass Effect 2 and 3. It is not that fully functional, you'll only get to use it a few times in the game, and because of that, you're mostly moving about, shooting like crazy, and believe me, it makes it feel like it's trying to be Call of Duty but in third person. Number 2. If you are a completionist and go to check all of the planets for either resources or hunting down the Protean artifacts or whatever, it takes forever. Trust me on this one. Only do this if you want to reach level 60. Number 3. The morality system. Whether you are Renegade or Paragon, you gotta put points to the ability chart if you want to get the specific dialogue tree that boosts the bar. Number 4. The M35 Mako. Or is it Mako? Uh, I'm calling it Mako. I despise it. Being so used to the M44 Hammerhead in Mass Effect 2, the Mako is so slow, clunky, and overall just... No! I know there's people who have nostalgic affection for this thing. I understood how people lost their shit when Andromeda was bringing it back. Just promise me one thing, Bioware. Give it rocket boosters! Now, I've been pretty vague with the story after Commander Shepard became a Spectre and all that, but now we're in the endgame. Skip ahead if you don't want spoilers, okay? Alright, don't say I didn't warn you. Shepard and the Normandy crew have now gathered enough information to track Saren down, from the icy world of Novaria, the human colony on Zeus Hope, and now off to freaking Vermeer, where the shit hits the fan. It turns out that Saren's ship wasn't really a ship at all. It is one of the many ancient synthetic organic starships, known by the Protheans as Reapers, that come every 50,000 years to eradicate the galaxy of all advanced civilizations and pave the way for the next species to grow on the path that the Reapers desire and kill them off to. Rinse and repeat. And why do they do this? Because they want to save the advanced species from destroying themselves. Salvation through destruction. Genius! Also, the Citadel and the mass relays? Yeah, they made them. Not the Protheans as the rest of the galaxy believes. And the Reapers killed them all. And Saren is working with them to somewhat save organic life. Somewhat. By striking up a deal to be like pets for the Reapers. Shepard and the crew escape Vermeer and, after defying the Council's orders, go after Saren to Ilos, where the Prothean beacon at the beginning of the game gave Shepard a warning about the Reapers that we now understand. Time is of the essence as they reach Ilos, only to get there too late. The Reaper, Sovereign, makes a full frontal attack onto the Citadel with the Geth in order to use it. Why? Because the Citadel is a makeshift mass relay that will allow the rest of Sovereign's brothers to instantly swarm the galaxy from dark space and start the galaxy-wide genocide. Shepard, with the help of a glitchy but still functioning Prothean VI, finds the conduit and instantly land back in a war zone inside the Citadel. The race against the clock begins as the team quickly traverse through the station and finds Saren again, ready to activate the relay. Shepard either fights full frontal against Saren or talks him out of it to do the right thing. And then... Thank you. But this isn't over yet. Sovereign is still here and needs to be taken down. Shepard opens the Citadel for the rest of the fleet to take care of business and... Oh my god, zombies there! In. Ah! Zombies! Ah! Someone get Norman Rita's here! You fight him off as the human, Asari, and Turian battle cruisers and ships fight back and Sovereign is down! This is a small nitpick, but the whole is the main character dead cliche that they use for the end of the climax does not work at all. I mean, yes, the whole destruction of Sovereign and his parts falling down onto the Citadel does not mean everyone comes out alive, but it's a bit of a step down, especially after the freaking smug grin. And so, the first human council member is chosen. The original Citadel Council are either dead and need replacements, or thank you for your courage. And the game ends with an inspiring speech from the new council member about having the races of the galaxy needing to work together for the upcoming Reaper threat. 
This game, despite all of its flaws, is quite amazing, especially when it first came out, but it hasn't aged that well. Yes, it's the first in the series. Limitations are always there with what the developers can and cannot do. It might have been quite the feat back in 2007, but it does not live up to the hype, along with an awkward animation and clumsy combat. Honestly, this is not a bad game. It's a good introduction to this new IP. I recommend you to play it at least once to get the feel of the overall story arc of the trilogy. It did help me better understand the world of Mass Effect when I played it for the first time after the glory that it is its sequel. But that's for next time. Assuming direct control.